Talo lava soy for Manuia, Melangi ma, Yorana, Misa Bolovanaka, Malo Ele, Talo Hani, Maori, hello, Ugeta. Welcome everyone to um, this presentation that I'm very pleased to be um, chairing just for the first part from Aotearoa, New Zealand. So I'd just like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I stand on right now, which is um, Nasi Fatua and Tamaki Makoto, um, along with the Ngunnawal people um, there in Canberra. So from my island to your island in the middle of Australia, um, welcome everybody. Um, what can I say about CLC except to say that he is someone who has a lot of perseverance, but also a lot of heart. So um, from this presentation, uh, what you'll be seeing is something that is um, a testament to um, his compassion, his empathy, but also his lived experience. Um, I just also want to uh, alert everybody that this presentation is currently be uh, currently being recorded, um, and we'll make some announcements about the recording later on um, at the end uh, of the seminar. But for now, I'd like to hand over to Siosi Malo Fafte. So lava. Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Kato. I acknowledge and pay respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, including Ngunnawal and Numbri people, and to all First Nations who are represented here, past, present, and emerging. As the enduring traditional owners and custodians of the land on which the Australian National University is located. I acknowledge that the land from which we all benefit has an ancient and uh, ancient history that is both rich and sacred, and that sovereignty was never ceded. And honor with gratitude, the sacred spiritual connection and stewardship over the land that we stand on. It's been over three years since my last visit to ANU uh, in February 2020, just prior to COVID, so it's really good to be back. Before I begin, a uh, trigger warning that my presentation has references to themes of suicide, uh, which some individuals may find uh, distressing both face-to-face -face and in the virtual rooms. Um, and whilst there is the opportunity to ask questions at the end. I'm not averse to feeling questions during the presentation. So this seminar is only a glimpse of my research. So I hope you are somewhat enlightened by it. Uh, this is the final stage of my thesis after a number of iterations and the working titles, um, Chasing a Dream that alas for most has never come true. In the final version of my thesis title, I added the term NRL or bust. That phrase was mentioned by two participants on numerous occasions. And this sets up the notion that sadly it's all or nothing and raises the question, what of those who fail to become a professional athlete? A professional football career is a brief outing for most and has a short time frame. The median career is only 10 games and no player actually wants to stop working when he retires from playing professional rugby league. Okay, so this is where it might be challenging. I'm going to change slides. The motivation for my research is twofold. Firstly, my research included practices that were grounded in, in my own personal experiences. These three lads are three of my four sons who have had some involvement with an NRL club or clubs. They all relocated to Australia at some point, but have all since returned to New Zealand. Their experiences were quite different from one another, but those journeys eventually provided the impetus of my research on young Pacific player relocation. My wife and I, accompanied James and Lorkini when they went to Sydney at different times to settle them in, uh, trusting that they would be looked after by their respective NRL clubs. <laughs> Both boys, however, encountered problems, and on one occasion, we ended up flying over to retrieve one of them at short notice. 
Tolabo, the baby of the three, his relocation was quite different. My wife and I had much more control of his relocation and return. So given my own positionality as a Samoan father from New Zealand, who has had and currently has connections with the research subject matter, I located my own research practices and insights in a philosophical conceptual framework for research, which I will introduce to you later. At the beginning of 2013, there emerged a cluster of youth suicides involving NRL players that took place over a six month period. These suicides were of up and coming players rather than those who had made their professional debut. My research is not about suicide or suicide ideation. However, that unique phenomenon 10 years ago helped also to spark my interest in the idea or the area of relocation because of the potential impact and relocation transition that it may have on mental health, especially for the young person. A relocation has a morbidity rate, morbidity being the state of being unhealthy for a particular disease or situation, which in this context is from mental health, from depression and anxiety, and mortality, once again, in this context, is the rate of suicide. However, when I'm talking about the relocation experience, I'm also thinking about the prospect of reducing the risks of morbidity and mortality associated with relocation. I'm not attempting to assert any causal links between them, but perhaps that is an opportunity for another uh, field of research inquiry. My research objectives were to firstly examine the positive and negative factors of young Pacific male rugby league players who relocate to Australia from New Zealand. Secondly, to examine how the NRL's relocation policies are working and look at what other relocation policies could do to assist the young Pacific NRL athletes. And thirdly, to identify what other wellbeing programs are available uh, for the athletes and if necessary, look at potential opportunities for the NRL. Getting the hang of this. In 2017, one of my, in one of my visits to the ANU, I, I put this picture together to help me with my midterm review, and I've used it since that time. Uh, I apologize that it's so difficult to read, but um, I do have hard copies uh, with me, and I'm happy to send it to anyone in the virtual rooms. I use the metaphor that is the formal fale, or meeting house, and use certain parts of it to represent my thesis. The 4-4 also allows me to bring my own Samoan heritage and background and to include a genuine and authentic pledge to my own inquiry, uh, to what grounds my research and how that shapes life histories from a Pacific uh, perspective. Over the duration of my research, I've been developing the 4-4 conceptual framework to include uh, Urotu Enderman's Fonofale model, which is a health model and was used initially to support medical practitioners with Pacific patients. It has since been used in wider contexts like education and the social sciences. The sociocultural dimension can be visited uh, through the four, four or the conch, which overlays against the Fonofale model. And this adds a strong Pacific lens to my life research life history, I beg your pardon, framework. Pacific life history accounts enable the Pacific athlete informants, participants, to draw on their own personal experiences and the significant events that help with their recollection of relevant facts about their relocation and pre-relocation experiences. An example of one of these critical events was how in one case, the passing of an immediate family member almost derailed the NRL pathway for one of the Pacific informants. His family talked, of it, talked him out of it. He debuted a couple of weeks following his return to Australia from New Zealand. Our ecological systems theory where Bronfen Breda's most basic belief states in scientific terms how trusting bonds with children are the most powerful force in positive youth development. Different environments and ecosystems uh, were a key feature of relocation. Formal Fale and the ecological systems theory helped me to understand the complexities of the various 
environments the young Pacific informants were exposed to. The New Zealand Health Research Council's Pacific Research Guidelines helped me to consolidate the boundaries within which its research operates and helped me to maintain safe research, a safe research space and practices for the particip uh, Pacific participants and for myself as an insider, outsider researcher. And finally, the Youth Development Strategy Aotearoa Ministry of Youth Affairs uses the values and principles of a strengths-based positive youth development relationship, which are also used during the Talanoa, the interviews with the participants. In my years as a youth worker, I have subscribed to using the strategy in my practice. So who knew? How did we choose our research collaborators and partners? I did, I did not choose informants or collaborators who were unsuccessful because it was just too difficult to, get, to gain access to them. I instead selected participants, most of whom had a successful relocation with a couple who hadn't. The findings across all of them proved very valuable nonetheless. I conducted three rounds of interview engagements. The stakeholder interviews, firstly, were held between July and November 2017. That group comprised six well-being and education staff from the NRL and two separate sets of house parents. As part of life history research, I then managed to have two rounds of Pacific in-depth Talanoa. Round one was between December 2018 and March 2019. Eight athletes consented to provide in-depth Talanoa. Seven of the eight relocated at 16 and 17. The 16 year olds relocated to Australian high schools on scholarship. Six of the eight went on to make NRL debuts. There were clear differences between the insights from the, and commonalities between the successful and unsuccessful Talanoa, uh, from situational circumstances uh, to having the misfortune of having a less than adequate player agent. Of the two who did, have not debuted, one is still in rugby league, uh, playing in a feeder, feeder system uh, in a lower grade competition, and the other has left the rugby league system altogether. In round two, between July and September 2019, second round of Talavor, Talanoa reviewed the previous Talanoa and identified gaps and recommendations from the participants. There are a number of issues raised by the athletes that contradicted the well-being and education stakeholder views. For example, Pacific players thought that they should have been supported more by the NRL system. Some stakeholders felt that the responsibility of relocation lay squarely on the shoulders of the players. I'm getting the hang of this. <laughs> To inform my research, I engaged in a wide-ranging uh, literature review. I don't know why I said it that way. <laughs> my literature review is in three main categories. First is the post-World War II movement from the Pacific Islands to New Zealand of islanders and their families seeking employment, education, and a perceived better life. I use a socio-historical view of a series of significant events and by listening to archival narratives of Pacific settlers to New Zealand and also in Australia. A couple of examples, the account of the blackbirding labor migration movement to Queensland in the 1800s, and also in New Zealand, the dawn raids in the mid seventies and how that followed an open invitation for cheap labor from the Pacific islands a few years earlier. There are also two contemporary research areas the second broad category is the phenomenon of young Pacific Island men moving to Australia based on a rugby league opportunity. That has attracted, that has attracted the attention of academics interested in Pacific involvement in professional sport generally and rugby league in particular. It is discussed in this literature review under the heading Pacific Sports Migration. The third world category looks at international labor migration uh, in pursuit of sporting opportunities, which is not new, 
It has been researched in the context of cricket and soccer and other sports in Auckland and elsewhere, uh, in England and elsewhere, uh, where there has been academic inter interest in influencing relocation success. Early research on athlete relocation for sport was concerned with the socio-political implications of this type of migration rather more than on the experiences of individual athletes. So to provide some context in terms of relocation, in New Zealand, Māori and Pacific peoples are distinctly different ethnic groupings. In Australia, Māori and Pacific are grouped together under the heading Pacific people, sometimes Pacifica. Uh, due to the timing of my research, I was only focusing on male athletes. The NRL Women's Premiership has had its inaugural season in 2018 after my research um, was underway. Uh, so this, that's certainly an area for, for further research inquiry. Uh, nonetheless, there may be similarities with my research in the relocation processes for women. And these uh, gender experiences should be examined in the future. In Australia, 37 years ago, in 1986, out of approximately 480 NRL players, there were only three recognized Pacific first grade NRL players in the whole of the competition. In each of the successive decades, Pacific player numbers in first grade climbed to approximately 43 players or 9% in 1996, 100 players or 21% in 2006, then a steady, a steady growth in 2016 to around 205 or 43% of Pacific players. In 2020, there were 230 or 48% registered players of Pacific descent. And in that, and in that I include along with Māori and Pacific from New Zealand, players from Fiji, Papua, New Guinea, and the Pacific Islands. In 2021, the NRL also stated that at times that figure peaked as high as 50% or closer to 240 players. Uh, so in broad terms, about half of the National Rugby League are Pacific at the NRL level, the top level. One way of looking at, at that scenario is that out of 16 teams, slightly less than eight teams would com could comprise solely of Polynesian players. The NRL has further advised that around half of the Pacific players playing in the NRL are from New Zealand. So of those eight teams, the fishers teams, or 240 players, 120, could be from New Zealand. With the New Zealand Warriors accounting for approximately 20 of those uh, NRL Pacific players, that leaves around 100 NRL players currently, spots currently being taken up by New Zealand players who have relocated to Australia. So that's over 20% of the NRL. On average, across the NRL, 10 New Zealand born players who relocate make their NRL debut each year. However, None of those 10 players who debut do so in the first year in their first year of relocation. It normally takes between three to five years, if they're lucky, often to debut after you've initially relocated. So what happens to the rest? Uh, nobody knows. Uh, what we do know is that many of them do not return to New Zealand. The NRL's Wellbeing Education Department agrees that relocation comes with varying degrees of challenge and has identified potential risk factors and triggers for the young Pacific athlete. They move away from the support of their families and social support networks. Fear of failure is a very real condition. Family members to be the provider is family pressures, I beg your pardon. Family pressures to be the provider is closely connected to fear of failure. Injury will take players away from earning potential and risk contract. I'll start that again. A big pardon. Injury will take players away from earning potential and risk contract negotiations. Isolation and homelessness affects players' mental well-being and never really leaves them. Non-selection impacts earning and potentially influences contract renegotiation. So there is a further link with fear of failure again. 
having no plan B is the focus of the well-being program because most players have a limited shelf life in terms of games played and athletes often question their move to Australia, especially with, with the three to five year development time frame to debut. They ask themselves in the early stages of relocation, will I survive? Mitigating these risks is essentially what my research is all about. Uh, I apologize for the size of, of the, the table and how, how it's really difficult to read. Uh, the table considers, this table considers the literature and interviews and Talanoa and the commonalities between uh, the threes. There appears to be good alignment with many factors with stakeholder and athlete Talanoa. But on the other hand, there are areas where the literature, interviews and Talanoa did not align. So I've just taken um, some of those key, th key themes. A combination, a clubhouse with house parents is the best option when that works well. The second choice seems to be finding board for the boys. They are, there are extensive policies in the English football system that would be very beneficial to the NRL in this area. The worst case scenario I encountered was find your own accommodation, find your own bed, and maybe find your own flat and just leave it to them, to the Pacific player to work it all out. He received poor service from his player agent and consequently, unsurprisingly, he still has not debuted. Education and employment with employment and education. These young Pacific players are coming from New Zealand, abandoning education and career earning opportunities and coming over to work long hours and basically 16 hour days when you can include travel to and from work and rugby league training. This is literally an overnight transition going from, from going to school in Auckland, where everything is taken care of by your parents and caregivers, to becoming an adult overnight with all the responsibilities necessary to live in Australia. For, the, for this cohort of participants, none of them chose to study. They all opted to work. They were worried about surviving and putting Fun and, and putting financial pressure on the appearance in New Zealand. Study was also not overly encouraged by the wellbeing and education staff either. Some, men had, some, made, sorry, some maintained that the young Pacific players had enough on their plate just getting to and from school and training and work. This was confirmed by one stakeholder who said that the option to study was difficult, if not impossible, unless the family was prepared to fund their son's costs of living and study. Finance, the boys are not getting enough money to live on from the club or the NRL. If these players, young players are contracted, they should be able to come here and should be paid enough by the NRL to live. Learning how to budget and spend is best when they have adequate remuneration built into their contracts. Brown faces, culture shock on arrival is made easier and is attenuated and acculturation is shorter if brown boys are sharing their experiences with another brown boy. This comes through very strongly from the athletes and this is unsurprising as well and has been reported before by Panapa and Phillips. No player said it was important to see brown faces in the wellbeing and education team. This contradicted the wellbeing and education stakeholder view who thought that having round faces is important. And in the time that my research was conducted, brown wellbeing education staff made up of less than 5% of that department. Cultural competency of staff. This is key. And house parents provided racism quotes to back this up. They witnessed accounts where Pacific boys were being singled out for with unfair treatment. Comments like, well, if you, they don't like it here, they can just pack up and go home from where they came from. This comes up with other references from Panapa, Lakisa and Adia and, and Taylor, uh, Masters and Uparisa and Mountjoy all have this as a feature of their studies on Pacific sports migration. Young players especially getting targeted compared to their, to their adult NRL first grade players were speaking up where speaking up is encouraged. I'm not sure what I was thinking when I read that. 
One white stakeholder said that compared to New Zealand, Australia is an extremely racist country and that it was 40 years behind in terms of cultural acceptance. No one mentioned cultural competency uh, at the junior level in any of the clubs. Any mention of cultural competency in clubs is directed at first grade level players where there are better coaches, more resourcing, and there is exposure and, and visibility for the adult NRL player. Your most vulnerable players, which include the young Pacific athletes, get the worst coaches, least amount of resourcing, which puts them at even more risk of failing uh, juniors Juniors consider themselves to be almost invisible. The NRL needs to invest in proper Pacific cultural competency training that has made a start, but from player and stakeholder accounts are still a long way behind. Opportunity cost, chasing an NRL career should not be a lifetime disadvantage. While you are chasing that career, you should be prepared for a career outside of the NRL. The NRL coins it having two plan A's, and its wisdom. Here are some stories. The opportunity cost for youth A is that he's given, a, he's given up a lucrative career in medicine for an under 18s SG ball opportunity at Club X in the NRL. Youth B and his father were planning for him to do an accountancy degree in New Zealand. He went to Club Y in 2019, did not study, and playing rugby league in Australia, he made a sacrifice between playing in the NRL or potentially being a Rhodes Scholar. Youth C, on the other hand. Youth C came close to finishing his BCom from AUT University in Auckland and was given all of the support from the New Zealand Warriors. And his tutoring was funded by the NRL in his contract. Why does relocating penalize the boys education. Youth A and B left at 17. Youth C relocated at 24 and having already debuted in the NRL and graduated with his BCom, but relocated at a, at a much older age. I'd now like to um, just highlight two key findings. Oh gosh, did that move that one yet? Did the slide change? It did. Oh, cool. Get to my age, man. Yeah, I'd now like to um, highlight two key findings. Comprehensive, the comprehensive approach to pre-relocation. There are two key findings I wish to highlight today. Firstly, preparation for relocation should be at least a 12 to 24 months process in New Zealand. In terms of physical preparation, are they fit enough? Are they strong enough? Will they be on the back foot if they weren't? Psychologically, people are more likely to call this resilience, equipping boys with the mental health skills to deal with life. They need to be on a career path before they leave New Zealand. Critical life skills. Oh my gosh, sorry about that. Critical life skills, important, important little things, important little things, like cooking your own meal, cleaning after yourself, doing your own laundry, grocery shopping, savings. I can see the parents going like there. Savings, driver licensing, obtaining a tax file number, registering for Medicare, setting up a bank account. And finally, up and navigating the Sydney public transport system is daunting at best. Is daunting at best for the 16 and 17 year old from New Zealand, let alone one who's Pacific. Having to make decisions when they've never had to do so, those big life decisions at 16, being able to open up to someone when issues arise. The second, um, okay, sorry, just try this again. The second major finding is having a robust relocation policy. When uh, asked 
when asking the wellbeing and education managers about the relocation policy, they all considered this to be it. It's one simply does not exist. Most of the stakeholders identified the administration of the LEVAR wellbeing assessment for relocation players to LEVAR is a mental health, um, mental health education provider in Auckland in New Zealand. The tool is a 100 point screen questionnaire that looks at um, five different domains in terms of youth develop in terms of development. The aim of the tool is to provide early warning signals to the NRL of any issues that may impact a player's relocation success. All stakers, all stakeholders were positive about the wellbeing tool being the policy, and most of them considered uh, it to be effective. Another drawback was there was no consistency either in how the tool was administered and generally the differences in relocation processes across the 16 NRL clubs. And the athletes were certainly unaware of what the relocation process was and the purpose of the tool and when and how it was being administered. For most, for most of the Pacific informers, they got on a plane, they hopped off, and most often someone met them at the airport to take them to their new dwelling, and that was a transition. Nothing more, nothing less. No one has produced research of Pacific labour migration in sport, and certainly no examples of research conducted on relocation of Pacific 16 or 17 year old athletes. During my visit to Australia in February 2020, I was invited to present my initial findings to the NRL. I received positive feedback from members of the wellbeing and education team and the wellbeing engagement program staff, the and rugby league players association and a consultant from the NRL's players uh, psychology department. Later that year, my wife and I set up a relocation hub in central Auckland and then a second hub in West Auckland early in 2022. My apologies, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get the hang of this. You think I had after being 75% of the way through. So later that year, my wife and I set up a relocation hub in central Auckland and then a second hub in West Auckland in early 2022. 2022. Over the past three years, we have continued to test my findings in terms of pre-relocation preparation with Pacific youth who have re relocated during that time. At the end of 2021, we commissioned an independent evaluation of our initial hub and have sent reports to the NRL and NZRL, NZRL being the New Zealand Rugby League. Uh, there is a likelihood that we will set up more hubs in South Auckland in the next six to 18 months. I've kept the NRL abreast of the development of the hubs and there is now keen interest, interest from the New Zealand Rugby League to see how we can develop a tripartite relationship between the three organizations. At the very least, the NZRL are keen for us to develop workshops for players and parents on player relocation. The ideal for us is to develop an NZRL, NZ, NZRL NRL funded hub that is based in Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch. Further research is required in this uh, the subject in area of inquiry. However, for the purpose of today, there are these are the eleven recommendations that have come through my research. They are in no particular order. Um, I would like, though, to highlight at least two of those. NRL-wide policies, minimum standards. In terms of cultural competency, minimum cultural competence standards for the 18s and the 20s, coaches and trainers and other staff. The question to ask the NRL is, how would you assess cultural competence, minimal standards for the NRL staff? Consider the effect on the mental health of players after repeated negative comments from coaches and trainers. I refer you to Dupree's and Etal's research. Eight, where 18 percent Pacific and 20 percent Indigenous players who suffer from depression, as opposed to five percent of their white counterparts, and then funding to close the educational gaps between Pacific and Indigenous. 
Pacific, Pacific and possibly indigenous players are forced to focus on earning enough to live on. Study is much lower in terms of priority. The players shouldn't have to work as long during the day and for the Pacific from New Zealand shouldn't be deprived of getting an education in Australia. At the moment, it's just not possible for the boys to have a second plan A because they can't go to university or, or TAFE and they can't do an apprenticeship. At the moment, it's just not possible. Repeating. Uh, youth should be given better opportunities to undertake further study after high school. Uh, the Telenor suggests that players cannot afford time or resourcing to study. The Wellbeing and Education Department's function is a bit of a misnomer if education is not being fully realized with its players. Well, in closing, I'd, I'd really like to thank the members of my research panel, um, my former chair, who's, who's chairing this morning, uh, Rowani Ngashu, Rochelle Bailey, uh, who's now my current chair, Gilda Rochelle, uh, Gerhard Sunborn from the University of Auckland, um, Gemma Manungahu, and previous panel members, uh, Richard Eves and Kate Henne. Kaptai te rima le ava no, ma aloa pito to my all up or far now research support colleagues in New Zealand and Australia who are supporting me online now. Uh, and I especially want to thank all of you for attending today uh, on a wet lunchtime. I uh, thank you. really appreciate you being here. And uh, lastly, my, my uh, aloha goes out to my, my family for their uh, unwavering support for my research endeavor. Thank you.